13th chapter of Revelation. 13th chapter. The dragon, the beast, horns, heads, pulling off of Daniel. So many things. The book of Daniel is absolutely necessary for understanding the book of Revelation. As you've noticed the last couple of times we've been together, we've spent time going back to Daniel, and we will do it again because John is pulling, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, off of Daniel. I mean, 700 years before this stuff would even happen. He gives it to Daniel, and now John is relating, now it's time for it to happen. Because what does he say at the very, very beginning in Revelation 1.1? He says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. The things that must soon take place. And then verse Verse 3, blessed is he who reads those who hear the words of the prophecy and take heed to the things which are written in it, for the time is near. See? And he, it's amazing. He's commenting back, especially in 13, as we get into that, he's commenting on uh, the contents of Daniel. Um, we've already seen some of that. We've been in Daniel 7. We're going to go back to that again tonight. A little bit in Daniel 8, and then a little bit in Daniel 12. All very necessary stuff and it all links together. And here, of course, the 13th chapter falls within uh, this parenthesis that I've talked to you guys about. Chapters 12, 13, 14, and the first few verses of 15 act as a parenthesis, as a bridge that takes us from the first understanding of the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jews throughout the Roman Empire and the second coming, and it takes us uh, through that up till uh, chapter 11, and then we get into this parenthesis. Well, in chapter 11, verses 15 down through 18, we've got Christ coming back, the kingdom established, judgment taking place, right? And now we're going to look at the same thing through a different window and a different door of this house that we're in, this homiletical house that views the book of Revelation. And that's where we come into the bowl judgments, which are very similar to the trumpet judgments. That takes place in chapter 16. But we need this parenthesis information. We're also going to take a look tonight, uh, slipping not now, but slipping over to chapter 17 in a little while, because what's going on in 13 has everything to do with an enabling us to uh, interpret correctly what's happening in chapter 17. So uh, we'll be doing that as well. Now, chapter 13, and I'm going to read it direct you, directly from my New American Standard to you. We are not going to get through the whole thing. I'll just, I'll just do the first half of chapter 13. And we're going to talk about the beast that rises from the sea. What is this? And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns, seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Who's the dragon, by the way? Satan. Satan, the devil, okay? Three, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon. Look at this, folks. They worshipped Satan because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? It's talking about Rome right there. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. And authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe, people, tongue, nation was given to him. But now remember, this is for a time. There is a short time. The devil, in chapter 12, has been cast to the earth. He now takes on the persona of the dragon. The Lord, 
with his uh, sovereign authority, gives him the ability now to take hold of the people of God for his own purposes. So God authorizes this. So we want to see where this is going to go. Eight, and all who dwell on the earth, land would be better right there, will worship him, everyone whose name, here's the qualifier, has not been written from the foundation of the world, in the book of the life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Okay, that's probably far enough. Now back up to the first chap of 13th chapter and the first verse. Now, I said to you at the very beginning, I'm just going to read this to you directly out of my New American Standard. Now, if, you, if, you, if that's what you're using tonight, and the top of verse 1 says, and the dragon stood, it probably doesn't unless you have a New American Standard. What the New American Standard is trying to do is just interpret for us by using a word, dragon, that is not in the Greek text right here. Uh, really, what is in the Greek text? text is, and he stood on the sand of the seashore. Uh, it really does go back to the top of 17, last verse of chapter 12. So the dragon was enraged with the woman, went off to make war with the rest of her children, and then he qualifies who they are, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Then some manuscripts will place the phrase, and he stood on the sand of the seashore. Um, that really is correct manuscript-wise. The papyri have got it that way. Those are the closest to the autographs that we have. Sinaiticus has it that way. Very important. Uh, Unseal manuscript. Unseal means capital letters. Uh, uh, the fourth from the fourth century. It's full. It's very. It's very. Uh, uh, very strong and complete. It has many of the books that make up all of the New Testament in that. Um, not all the manuscripts have that, but Alexandrinus also shares uh, in that, and so that's important too. But it, it really says, and he stood on the sand of the seashore. Now that's kind of minor, but I just wanted you to know the way it lays out in regards to the way John actually wrote it. So I believe John wrote, and he stood on the sand of the seashore. But if the he references back to the dragon in particular. Now the dragon being Satan, we got that from chapter 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. So there's our interpretation. 13.1 now. And the he stood on the sand of the seashore. He stands on the sand of the sea. Thalasso is really what the Greek text says. You got that idea. Yeah, you got that. Uh, you got the I implication going on right there, that he has got his foot on the nations because in Hebraisms like this, um, the, the sand on the seashore points to many peoples, people groups, and nations, and this kind of a thing. So he's got his, his feet on that. that. That promotes the idea of an authority. Satan has been given a certain amount of, of authority. Now it's for this time in history when Rome is used by God and John calls Rome the beast. And uh, we'll prove that, of course, through Daniel and everything. Calls Rome the beast. Satan is now giving the beast his gas, his ability. He's got, he's got him plugged in to the electricity, as it were, to make uh, his, uh, his desires work for him. So he's being empowered by Satan. Rome is being, it's a satanic nation, in other words, and is being powered by that. And it's affecting all of these nations, okay? Now, continuing in verse 1, Then I saw... A beast coming up out of the sea. Now get the picture right here. Here you've got this dragon which represents Satan. He's on the sand of the sea or the seashore. Okay, And now here comes this beast out of the water. Right? Appearing before its master, the dragon. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. So out of the nations. Rome rises from the nations. And it has ten horns. And seven heads. Well, of course, we've already learned that these horns represent kings. We find that from Daniel 7.24. You could write that in your margin right there if you want to. Daniel 7.24. Horns are kings. Heads are kingdoms. And on those horns were ten diadems. So each horn gets a diadema. It is a king's crown. 
a diadema is, a king's crown, and on his heads were blasphemous names. Now, since it's all brought under the one beast, it's telling us that these ten nations that, that have these ten kings, ten horns, as it were, with, with crowns on them, are all under the control and empowered by Satan, who is, who is the one who is empowering Rome, to do what God's plans are right now at this time. So we've got that going on. Okay, now, to bring us back into, into the, uh, the arena here, of context. I'm going to take you back to Daniel. And we're going to the seventh chapter. This time, chapter 7 and verse 19. Chapter 7 and verse 19. Gosh. Yeah. Chapter 7 and verse 19. He's already had this vision, which we're going to go back to in a little bit here. Four great beasts in verse 3 that come up out of the sea, out of the nations. The first one's described as a lion. The second one is a bear that's hunched over on one side, but it's got three ribs in its mouth. And then there is a leopard. And on its back it has four wings. These four wings represent something specific. And then in the seventh verse, you've got this fourth beast, which is dreadful, terrible, uh, terrifying, extremely strong. It has large iron teeth, just like the legs in chapter 2 of Daniel. The legs uh, point to uh, Rome as being uh, of the metal of iron, okay? Now it's got iron teeth. It devours and cramp tramples down uh, the remainder with its feet, so on and so forth. It is different from the rest. But now the angel is before Daniel right now, and he's going to give him some interpretation. Daniel says in verse 15, As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. Well, he just showed him, verses 13 and 14, which is the parousia of Christ. Daniel doesn't know what this is that he's seeing, you know. Uh, he gets the parousy of Christ. He says it's one like a son of man that was coming. So he's using biblical language, using the same language that, of course, Christ would use on himself. That was Christ's most potent and favorite term for himself was son of man. And the reason for that is passages just like this. Okay, And he comes up to the Ancient of Days. He doesn't know this is the Father. Daniel doesn't have a Trinitarian understanding of what's going on right here. And all this dominion is handed over to him. All right, verse 15, now 16. I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise out of the earth. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. So once that takes place, once that takes place, which it, do, it, it does, by the way, once verse 14 kicks in in regards to history, that means it continues. It doesn't stop. And then hundreds or, th or even thousands of years go by, and then it kicks up again like much futurism teaches today. It just continues from this time that the saints are given the kingdom, and it's the kingdom that they possess forever and ever. Well, that's exactly what it says at the bottom of verse 14. This dominion, Christ's dominion, everlasting dominion, will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. We see this consistently. All right, now verse 19. Then I desire to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast. Now, this is Revelation 13. This is what we're just, uh, studying in Revelation 13. I desire to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. Exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron, its claws of bronze. Well, let's see. In the... Uh, in the, uh, the giant statue of Daniel 7 that Nebuchadnezzar has the dream over, bronze, it's the arms, you know, and the, and the shoulders and whatnot, and the chest of bronze. And that represents who, do you remember? Greece. Yeah, Greece. We got the Grecian thing going on right there. So this fourth beast is made up of all of these uh, kingdoms, you see. So here's that, and it devours and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And the meaning of the ten horns, just like Revelation 13, beast has ten horns, and the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up. Okay, that's an eleventh horn. What is this other horn that came up? I'll come back to that. Which were 
th which before three of them fell. Namely, that means that that this horn has direct authority over the kingdoms that those other horns which represent kings uh, ha uh, no longer have authority over. Now this little horn, this eleventh horn, uh, has got total control over these three kingdoms. The, the horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, that's the 11th horn, which was larger in appearance than its associates. I kept looking, and that hor horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Now, I'm going to tell you who this is, and I'm going to take you to Daniel 17 to do that. 22, until the Ancient of Days came. And who's that? Ancient of Days. It's the Father because we've got him described in verse 13 along with the Son of Man. When God is described within the, the tri-personality of what we understand the Trinity to be or the Godhead, then, then the Ancient of Days in this case would be the Father. The Son, of course, is the Son. The Holy Spirit would be three. And he says in 22, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. So the saints are going to rule and reign. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns out of his kingdom, ten kings will arise. And another, this is the eleventh horn, will arise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. Now, uh, I don't know if that's a reference back to verse 5 where the three ribs in the mouth of the bear, which represents the Medo-Persian Empire, I don't know if those are to be uh, understood as the same or if these are different now. Because in the Medo-Persian Empire, we had Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt that the Medo-Persians controlled, right? You probably already got it written down. Well, now we've got this 11th horn. It could very well be verse 5, or it could be something else. I don't have the answer for that, so let's just move on. And there's a couple things I'm going to say to you tonight that I'm just going to say, you know, could be this, could be that. I'm not entirely sure. And he said, well, I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 24, so we have the previous ones that subdue three kings, now 25. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. All right, so here's this this 11th horn now, and it's blasphemy, and it's speaking against God, and, and uh, horrible things coming out of its mouth. Very similar to what we just saw in 13, and the beast with its big mouth, and one of the heads that was slain. I'll come back to all of that. This is all linked to that. 25, he will speak out against the Most High, and wear down the saints of the highest one. I think this is Nero. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, which he did, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. There's that three and a half year theme again presented. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away and annihilated and destroyed forever. Now Nero died in AD 68. His kingdom goes on. But he was given authority for three and a half years. But then that is interrupted by his death. Now, we really don't know for sure whether he took his own life, he was crazy enough to do it, or if somebody else murdered him. We're really not sure. Historians are not sure. And I don't know that historians are the best people to go for for, for accuracy in regards to a biblical subject anyway. Then 27. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. Uh, this happened in the first century. It had to happen during the time of Rome, when Rome was the worldwide power, that the kingdom would come like this. And we know that from, and I want you to look at it, Daniel 2 and verse 44. Daniel 2 and verse 44. 
Now Daniel has already given the dream to Nebuchadnezzar, and he's given the interpretation starting back in verse 36. And now he says in 44, in the days of those kings. Remember, we touched on this once already. Well, he presents Babylon starting in verse 36 and 37. It's actually Nebuchadnezzar, but he certainly represents Babylon. And then in 39, we've got Medo, Persia, and Greece. And then in 40 and following, we have Rome. So he stops with Rome. And so he says, in the days 44 of those kings, Kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. So God sets up his son's kingdom. This is Daniel 7, 13 and 14. This is the kingdom, the dominion that is given to Christ, which will never be destroyed and which will be eternal, right? But it has to happen in the days of those kings. See? Babylon... Medo, uh, the Medes and the Persians, and Greece. See, these they were not full reigning kingdoms anymore, but they were still around under Rome's control. You have to understand that. Those people were still around. Rome is, is, is the acting powerhouse. This is the beast that the dragon, Satan, gives his power to. See? And this kingdom... This kingdom that God says he's setting up in 44, which he sets up and which will never be destroyed, that's Christ's kingdom, 7, 13, and 14, has to be set up during the time of those kings. Well, the very last kingdom that's presented is Rome. So it has to be during that time. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. See, this is Ramza to us, okay? This is not going to happen some far off down the road. It will not be left for another people. No. And it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it itself will endure forever. That's Christ's kingdom. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone, now this continues how it gets crushed. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, this is Christ's kingdom, without hands, means not manufactured by men, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. Some 700 years in the future right here, see? All right, so having, all, having said all of that, looking back at Revelation 13 now, so he sees this beast coming up, verse 1, out of the sea, and it has ten horns, seven heads. Well, right away, we know what it's, he's talking about from Daniel 7. On his he horns were ten diadems, on his heads were blasphemous names. We look back at chapter 17 of Revelation now. Chapter 17. And uh, we are presented with the great harlot, which is, by the way, Jerusalem and the Jews therein. That's right. It is Jerusalem and the Jews therein that are the great harlot because spiritually that's how God saw them. Capitulating to Rome, um, multiple polythe oh, I should just say polytheism going on right there, uh, working with them for great economic success. Verse 2 says, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, porneos, Fornication is what it is. And those who dwell on the land were made drunk with the wine of her porneos. He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names having seven heads and ten horns. All right, that's the beast of chapter 13. Same beast of Rome that's in Daniel 7, right? And we've got that same Clue, seven heads and ten horns. So Rome, she is sitting on that. That means that Rome is supporting the whore. The whore being uh, Jerusalem and the Jews at that time. Now this wouldn't be absolutely every one of them, but those who had an opportunity to leave, to get out of there at the beginning of the three and a half years, when Cestus Gallus pulled back, right? If you stayed, you participated in all of what is taking place right here. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, precious stones, pearls, having her hand in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and the unclean things of her immorality. On her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Look down at uh, verse 18, chapter 17 and verse 18. The woman whom you saw, this is obviously... 
uh, being interpreted now for John. The woman that you saw, that would be the, the great harlot, the woman on the beast, is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. What's that? Jerusalem. That's right. How do you know it's Jerusalem? <laughs> Chapter 11, verse 8. Exactly correct. You should write that right next to verse 18. 11, 8, right next to verse 18. That great city wherein our Lord was crucified. That's 11, 8. And so we keep seeing this again and again and again. That's how we know the great city is or was Jerusalem, which reigns over the kings of the earth. That's what chapter 18 verifies for us. All of these economic powers under the Roman Empire that she reigns over, it's talking about all the treasure and all the economic fortune that went on and into the hands of the Jews at that time. Looking at chapter 17 and now verse 8, chapter 17 and verse 8, the beast that you saw was. Now things are going to change a little bit here. We've been being told so far in Revelation and in Daniel that the beast is Rome, yes? Now he's going to put a spin on it. There's where things get interesting. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. The beast that you saw was. Well, wait a minute. Rome was already in control at this time. So what does he mean? The beast that you saw was. He's using the same name. And, and it, it says that whatever this beast was and is not, in other words, it was not active during John's time when he's writing this. The beast that you saw was, it had some kind of activity in the past, historically. Right now it doesn't. Right now meaning in the first century as John is getting this information. Because what? It's down in the abyss, the abuso, and it has got to come up out of the abyss. And then we'll go to destruction after it fulfills certain things. And those who dwell on the land whose name has not been written in the book of life. See how important that is? If you stayed in the land after you had the opportunity to leave, it verifies that your name was not written in the book. Because the Christians in the first century were looking for what Jesus said to them in Matthew 24. When you see, you know, Jerusalem surrounded by armies, Luke 21, Matthew 24, 15, the abomination that makes desolation, Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you get out, you run, you don't come back into the city. Then they did it. They had north, went to Pella. Those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Okay, I'm just going to tell you exactly what I think is happening right here. I think that this beast that he's talking about, I think that this beast is not Rome because this thing is not in the first century. It was, but as John is writing, it is not, but it's about to come up out of the abyss. Out of the abyss. I think this is some demonic power, and I think it's that which inhabits either Rome in general or Nero specifically. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that Nero was a demon-possessed, crazy person. No question in my mind about that. And I think that this is what empowered him to do what he did. Now, that's just my opinion on the matter. Uh, you know, lots of commentators have lots of different opinions on this whole thing. I brought a couple more books to give you some examples uh, tonight in regards to that. But here is verse 9. Here is the mind now which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. So things change now because horns are kings, heads are kingdoms when we're talking about the beast uh, a.k.a. Rome as we've seen it in Daniel 7 and earlier in Revelation 13. But now, here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen, 
one is, the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must remain a little while. All right, some commentators will say, well, these, these seven heads, which he says are seven mountains, are the seven mountains that Jerusalem is built upon, because there are seven mountains that Jerusalem was built upon. I don't think that's accurate. I think the seven mountains here are talking about the seven hills of Rome, mm -hmm. because the context is about Rome. It's about the beast. It's about the power that comes out of that. And so the seven heads and the seven mountains, the woman sits on this. We've already seen earlier in chapter 17, the woman, she gets all of her power and gains all of her influence and all of her economy being supported by Rome. She's in bed with Rome. And then he moves in, into uh, verse 10 and starts talking about, I think, the seven Caesars. That's what works here for me. And they are seven kings, or Caesars. Five have fallen. I know we went through this once before. You remember who the five were that had fallen? Who's the first uh, Caesar that fell? Good. Julius? <laughs> Julius Caesar. Who's the second one? Augustus. Did you guys not write this down? Third one was? Tiberius. Tiberius, very, very good. Fourth one, Caligulus. Oh, nasty. Caligulus, bad. And then Claudius. Claudius. Now, Claudius, I believe Paul speaks about Claudius in general uh, Jewish metaphorical terms to hide the information. Um, it's worth looking at. Uh, second Thessalonians. I'll come back to this in just a second. Second Thessalonians now. Second chapter. Watch this. Oh, yeah. Chapter 2, verse 1. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now, we request... Now, watch your context here. We request you, brethren, with regard to the parousia coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's episunogoges. Epi, our synagoguing together unto him. You know what that is? That's Matthew 24, 31. That's what Jesus said would happen when he came back in his second coming. Result of the second coming, Matthew 24, 31. It's also 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 17. That's the arpazo, the drawing, the seizing, the seizing. When Christ comes back, he seizes all past, present, and future saints. Whether you're alive yet or not, it happens then. And in the spiritual realm, post AD 70, when you die past AD 70, I believe that you go to that moment of time. And so you participate in that. You will all be there with all the Christians for all time. Because this is a timeless realm. He says that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message, epistle, or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. It has not come yet. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasia, the falling away, comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. He is the son of destruction. What does the text say about the beast? In chapter 17, he comes out of the pit and goes into destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now there's a possibility that that could be referring to uh, an image of Nero that got placed in the, in the temple. I don't think so, but that's what some commentators say. I'm just giving you the benefit of that. See, I think what's happening right here is we're getting, we're continuing to see Paul's use of the Hebraic metaphor here, where it says in the middle of four that this man of lawlessness, Nero, I believe, uh, takes his seat in the temple of God. It, He's already talked about the fact that the in verse 3, the apostasy must happen first. Well, see, once Nero takes his seat in the temple of God, I think that's a, a reference to him influencing the temple or the temple or the church. Think of 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, right? The church is referred to as the temple there. Um, 
I think it's referring to the temple, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, in the church, displaying himself as being God. Some kind of influence where he takes his seat. That's a, that's a statement of authority, taking his seat in this way. Brother, do you want me to move over a little bit so you can see? Or, are you okay? You all right? All right. Heck yes, Mary, you're in everybody's way. What do you no, mean? No, you're fine. <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> no, enough of that moving. Verse 5, do you not remember? Remember, I'm talking to you about Claudius, okay? Not all this other stuff, but you get it on the way. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know, okay, here we go, what restrains him now, or it could be who restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. I'm convinced that the man of lawlessness here is Nero. I think this is in reference to Daniel 7. This is the little horn. This is Nero. This is also Revelation 13. This is the, the beast. And this is the uh, Revelation 17. The, the, the uh, demonic power that comes up out of the abyss, right? And takes hold of Nero, I think. You know what restrains him. Hmm. Katakon is the Greek word for restrain right there. Katakon. Katakon. It's very close to the name Claudius in Greek. Uh, uh, uh. Claudius. I think it's in reference to him. See, Claudius dies. And then who's up to take the purple after that? Nero is. And Nero does. There's, you know, he, Nero could have had something to do with Claudius's death, for that matter. And so now you know what or who Katakon restrains. That's correct. Him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work in the first century when he wrote this. Only, here we go, he who now restrains, and the word is Katakon right there, or Katako. He who now restrains, noun form, will do so until he is taken out of the way. When Emperor Claudius is removed, that means the man of lawlessness comes forward and the time of apostasy takes place because Nero begins to influence the church with his false gods, all of his polytheism, and that's what brings about the apostasy towards the end, AD 66, 270 right there. Then, verse 8, that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Well, he certainly did that even though Nero dies prior to that. Remember, this is all metaphor. We're not looking for information that nails, nails uh, the time on the clock down to the last second. That is, the one whose coming is in accordance with the activity of Satan. Ah, activity of Satan. Revelation 17. The beast that comes up out of the Abuso, and I believe inhabits Nero. Whose coming is in accordance with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, with all deception of wickedness. For those who perish, they perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. If you get me into verses 11 and 12, I'll never come back. So uh, we better leave that be at this point. So, interesting. Now, back to Revelation 17. Oh, yeah, we're going to get right through chapter 13. You bet. Revelation 17, all right. And 10, and there are seven kings, or Caesars. Five have fallen, one is. Well, the one that, well, that is at the time that the revelation was taking place, just prior to 8066, was... Nero. And the other has not yet come. Who's the other that would come? Galba. Galba. And when he comes, he must reign a little while. How long did he reign? Keys. <laughs> Good notes. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth. <laughs> an eighth and is one of the seven. And he goes to destruction. That means that all of these emperors were produce, producing their, uh, uh, their rule and their reign through the power of the demonic. That's how the eighth is. The, the eleven, the beast which was and is not. No, that's verse 
verse 8, the beast you, which you saw was and is not about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. It's exactly what we just got through reading in 2 Thessalonians 2. Now, this beast, verse 11, which was and is not, wasn't, wasn't happening at the time of, uh, of, uh, of Dan, uh, Dan, uh, John, is himself also an eighth, an eighth Caesar. And is one of the seven, one of the seven Caesars. And he goes to destruction, back to the abyss. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have not yet received a kingdom. See that? Horns are kings. I would, I would link all of that together, draw a circle around that or something. Ten horns, ten kings. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with a beast for one hour. That just means a short period of time. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast because it's demonically controlled, you see. So they just submit everything to the beast. Now back to 13. And so, verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. This is one that's coming up out of the sea, right? Like a leopard. All right, that's Greece. So it has a portion of Greece in it. You know, I just, I just think that, that Daniel 2.44 should be kept in mind right here. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Here it is. He's saying here that the leopard, Greece, is a part of this beast, which in Revelation 13 context is Rome. I saw a leopard. His feet were like those of a bear. That's Medo-Persia. That's Daniel 7. Remember the bear lifted up on one side with how many ribs in his mouth? Three. Uh, three, exactly. Those represent? Egypt. Yes. And? <laughs> Egypt? Syria. Uh, no? Not Syria. No, sorry. But I'll share a cigar with you if I can find one. <laughs> uh, Babylon? Egypt? Lydia. Lydia, okay? All right. Uh, feet were like a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. Well, that's Babylon. That's Daniel 7. And the dragon, Satan, gave him his power and his throne and great authority. This is telling us that the Roman Empire was demonically, not just influenced, but powered by Satan. Oh my gosh! They should never find that in a history book. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, one of his heads, Remember, he had seven heads. Heads represent kingdoms. And I saw one of his heads, a kingdom, as if, as if. Now, that comes from the, the Greek word hos here, and that's known as a particle of comparison. Isn't that nice? 810. Particle of comparison. Does that not bless you? I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain. So it would be one of the kingdoms under the control of, of uh, the beast, which is under the control of the dragon, as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was therapuo, was restored. Now, now, right after Nero died, a, a Neronic cult raised up and promoted a point of uh, false teaching known as Nero Redivivus. Yeah. Nero Redivivus. And it was this theory that Nero would be resurrected and he'd come back and he'd reassume the purple again, uh, the Caesarship there in, in Rome. Nero Redivivus. A lot of people think that that's what this is referring to. I don't think so. That, that, that's outside of the biblical form of things. We got we to gotta find out what the heck this is. I saw one of his heads, kingdoms, as if it had been slain. As if. Meaning, this is metaphor. It, it wasn't truly slain, but it was as if. And his fatal wound was restored. And the whole land, Guy, was amazed and followed after the beast. Sure, because the whole land is being 
pulled along by demonic influence. Because remember what we just saw in chapter 17? This beast, which is a demon, I think, comes up out of the Abuso and inhabits Nero. And now he's having a direct effect, bottom of three, on the whole land because they stayed. When Cestus Gallus pulled back, these people stayed. They stayed in Jerusalem. They stayed in the vicinity. Because their, their commitment was to Jerusalem and to the religion of the Jews. And the religion of the Jews was foul and stinking and petulant. Four, and they worshipped the dragon. They're Satan worshippers in the first century. These Jews were Satan worshipers. Man, this is turning some heads. You know, Whoever's ever watching this is like, <laughs> the Jews were Satan worshipers? Yeah, in the first century they were. And they worshiped the dragon, which is Satan, because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with him? Yep. They're, they're totally there. There was given to him, here it is, given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months, three and a half years, was given to him. Time, times, half a time. 1,260 days. Same thing. Now notice, what you should do here is right next to verse 5, write Daniel 7, verse 8 and 25. Daniel 7, verse 8 and 25. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words. This is the little horn. I won't turn to take you back to it. You can look at it later. This is the little horn, which is the 11th horn, which I believe is Nero. And he's speaking these things against, well, what does it say in verse 6? He opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, which is the same as a temple, by the way. That is those who dwell in heaven. Now, you ought to sort of maybe consider cross-referencing what I just read to you right there, bottom of verse 6, with 2 Thessalonians 2. And I forget the, the verse number, but the passage that says, oh, here we go, verse 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, how that this this man of lawlessness opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God or the tabernacle of God, displaying himself as being God. Well, here in Revelation 13 and verse 6, he's blaspheming God's name and his tabernacle. That's his church. It's the people of God. It's the same people back there in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4. Those who dwell in heaven, because that's where they were at that time. These are the Hebrews 12, 22 and 23 people. These are the righteous ones that live in heaven, that are bodiless during the first century because they had physically died from the time of Christ's ascension uh, up to the parousia. They were bodiless because the parousia is required according to 1 Corinthians 15, 23. The parousia is required in order for the resurrection to take place. Okay? They are then given their bodies according to 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2. 7 now. I'm going to skip reading those books to you. It was also given to him to make war with the saints. Well, that's Daniel 7, verses 21 through 25. Daniel 7, verses 21 through 25. I'd write it right next to verse 7 there. Given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on the land will worship him. They're totally overcome with this demon. And everyone whose name has not been written in, uh, from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Uh, write chapter 17, verse 8 next to that. 17, verse 8. That's a cross-reference. We actually just got through reading that. There's two places in the book of Revelation that speaks about the Lamb's book of life. And that's Revelation 13, 8. And 
Two places, 13.8 and 17.8. Now notice, who are these people that give themselves over to Rome and to this satanic worship? And by the way, when we get into, Lord willing, next uh, Wednesday, verse 11, down to the end of this chapter, we're going to talk about the beast now that rises from the earth. And this is really all about the polytheism and the religion, multiple God uh, religion of Rome that is presented to us as, as a kind of a priest. And it's a demonic priest. And he is leading the people of, of Rome, all of them throughout Rome. He's leading them in worship. And this includes the whore, of course. So everyone whose name, verse 8, has not been written uh, from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who has been slain. These are the ones who will worship him. Uh, they're not saved. They're not going to be saved. They haven't got a chance. Their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. They are not elect is what this is saying. Some, some of the doctrine of preterition. Preterition is referred to here, but it can also just be the doctrine of God's wrath. The doctrine of God's wrath. Uh, for instance, I, I can probably finish up with this. Uh, in Proverbs 16 and verse 4, people who don't have a chance by God's hand of grace. Yep, hand of grace. Because they live in a world under his hand of grace. They experience his, his, his oxygen. They experience good health. Uh, they experience prosperity. They experience the sunshine and all that comes along with that. Verse four, uh, Proverbs 16, 4. The Lord has made everything for his own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Hmm. Even the wicked for the day of evil. How about John 12 and verse 37? John 12, verse 37 But though he, Christ, had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, you should underscore that, could not believe, for Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes, and he has hardened their heart. That's 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, by the way. I want to write that. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. You know, now I am going to give you the one I pulled away from earlier. Uh, 2 Thessalonians. What is it? Verse 11, I think. 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 11 and 12, watch this. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11 and 12. For this reason, God will send upon them. See, these are the people whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. <gasps> That's right. Believe what is false. In order that they all may be judged. In order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. On the other hand, 13, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning, so your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Uh, I'll give you one more right off the top of my head. Jude. Verse 4, Jude, verse 4. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand. You know who this is? This is probably, this is probably the religion of Nero, the polytheism of Rome that we just got through reading about in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4 where he takes his seat in the temple of God where he creeps in with all of his other buddies. He creeps in who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. 
That's just rampant wickedness. And deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just finish this quick. Revelation 13, verse 9. So if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. This just means that at this point in history, when this is being written, at the time that these things will take place, or, or did take place, that these destinies are set. They're set. They're not going to be changed. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, well, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Because they have to go through all this. They had to stand through all of this, the true saints. They had to go through all of that. And that leaves us getting ready for the beast that comes up out of the earth. And we'll talk about that. I've already given you a little heads up of what he's going to be. This is going to be the religion of Nero, which of course is the religion of the dragon, which is what the Jews of the first century were worshipping. Were worshipping. They were Satan worshipers. They were Satanists. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would take these things, Lord, and just encourage us to study more, to push forward into your book, Lord God. We ask in Jesus' name that those things that are unclear to us, Lord, that you would make them clear to us, O oh Father. And if there are some things, Lord God, that are to be held in check, for your glory, Lord, then you go ahead, Lord, and, and just hold back what you will. And we will just put ourselves in a position of just being awed at you and awed at your word and the things that you are expressing. You, you, don't, have to, uh, uh, you don't have to express any of these things to us. You don't have to show us a thing, Lord. You're under no obligation to save us or nothing. Just by your wonderful, incredible grace, Lord, what more can we say except thank you, take our lives and let them be full and beautiful, our God, for thee. Let it be so. And we love you tonight. We ask you, Lord God, that you would take your people, bless them for coming tonight, Lord. Uh, bless and promote this work on YouTube, O oh Father. Prosper your church, Lord God, here in Omaha and throughout the United States. We pray for that, Lord. And we thank you for hearing our prayers tonight earlier, Lord, how you're healing the bodies of your saints and doing a wonderful thing in us, O oh God. And we thank you now, Lord, as we go our separate ways, Lord God, that you would bless us and keep us and make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Lift up your countenance upon us. Give us peace in Jesus' name. Thank you for these things, Lord. Amen.